Welcome back. In our last session, we took our first look at magnetic fields and how they relate to the familiar concepts of current and inductance. We learned about Ampere's law, which states that a current will produce a magnetic field. The current can be either a conduction current in a conductor or a displacement current in a dielectric. We also learned about Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction, which states that a time-varying magnetic flux through a loop will induce a potential in that loop, also known as an electromotive force, or EMF. In this session, we will apply these principles to analyze and calculate the inductance of different configurations that you will see quite often. Remembering that inductance is defined as the magnetic flux per unit current that caused it, once you determine the inductance of a given configuration, you can determine the total coupled flux simply by multiplying the inductance by the culprit current. In order to determine the inductance of a given configuration, we start with the magnetic flux density generated by a current, then we calculate the total magnetic flux by integrating over the loop area of interest, then we divide by the current to get the inductance. Let's go back to our coaxial cable configuration with a center conductor of radius A and outer shield with inner radius B. The center conductor carries a current I and the total length of the cable is L. The current will generate a magnetic flux through the rectangular area between the conductors. Looking at the cross section with the current pointing outward from the screen, the B vector will wrap in a counterclockwise direction and will have a magnitude at a distance r from the center of mu times i divided by 2 pi r. Ignoring fringing effects at the ends, we can take this magnitude to be constant along the length of the cable. The total flux coupling through the rectangular area between the conductors is the integral of b from a to b multiplied by the length, giving mu i l over 2 pi times the natural log of b over a. We divide by the current to get the inductance, and we can divide by L to get the inductance per unit length of a coaxial cable. Here is a graph of this expression for a relative permeability of 1. Most coaxial cables will have a B over A ratio from just a little bit over 1 to about 2 or 3, so the inductance per unit length is typically on the order of a few hundred nanohenries per meter. Now we'll go back to the parallel wire configuration. The top wire carries a current of plus i, the bottom wire carries a current of minus i, and both wires have length L. Both currents will generate magnetic flux that couples into the rectangular area between the wires, and from the right-hand rule, both contributions will point in the same direction and will add. Looking at the cross-section, the radius of both wires is A, and the distance between the centers is capital D. This calculation will follow a very similar approach to the one we used for capacitance. The outer surfaces of the wires are equipotential surfaces, and we can think of the currents as a pair of small linear image currents, with the positive current going into the screen and the negative current coming out of the screen. When the wires are far apart, these images are located at the geometric center of each wire, but when the wires are brought close together, the images move off center by a distance d sub i. The distance from the geometric center of either wire to the other wire's image is small d equal to large d minus d sub i. The positive wire will generate a flux density b1 at a distance r1 equal to mu i divided by 2 pi r1. The flux phi1 from the positive wire is given by multiplying this expression by the length l and integrating R1 from A to D, giving mu I L over 2 pi times the natural log of D over A. By symmetry, the flux generated by the negative wire will have the same magnitude, and it points in the same direction due to the right-hand rule. The total flux is the sum of the two contributions, canceling out the factor of 2 in the denominator. We divide by the current to get the inductance, and we divide by L to get the inductance per unit length of mu over pi times the natural log of small d over A. 
As we showed in the calculation of capacitance for the parallel wires in the session on electric fields, the relationship between small d and large d is given by this expression, giving us the inductance per unit length for parallel wires of mu over pi times the natural log of d over 2a plus the square root of d over 2a squared minus 1. Here is a graph of this expression for a relative permeability of 1. Two wire transmission lines will typically have a d over 2a ratio from just a little bit over 1 to about 2 or 3, depending on the thickness of the wire insulation, and the inductance per unit length is typically on the order of a few hundred nanohenries per meter. When d over 2a is greater than about 10, the logarithm argument simplifies to d over a, and due to the logarithmic relationship, the inductance does not change much and is typically on the order of a few microhenries per meter. You will sometimes see only this simplified expression, but you really need to know the full expression for wires that are close together, because that's where much of our interest lies. Now we can look at a wire with radius A at a height H above a ground plane, which is the configuration we used in our demonstration. Here we can make use of the method of images. The magnetic flux lines will appear as though there is a negative image of the wire at the same distance on the other side of the ground plane. Now it looks like the two-wire configuration that we just analyzed, and we just have to look at a couple of key differences. Instead of using D as the distance between wires, now we are using h as the physical height of the single wire above the ground plane, so we will substitute 2h for d in our equation for the inductance of parallel wires. We can think of the inductance between the wire and its image as two inductances in series that are virtually connected at the ground plane. Thus, the inductance for the wire above the ground plane is half the inductance that we would get between a pair of real wires separated by a distance 2h, giving us the inductance per unit length of mu over 2 pi times the natural log of h over a plus the square root of h over a squared minus 1. Here is a graph of this expression for a relative permeability of 1. As expected, it looks a lot like the graph for parallel wires, but with half the magnitude. When h over a is more than about 10, the logarithm argument simplifies to 2h over a, and due to the logarithmic relationship, the inductance does not change much and is typically on the order of about 1 microhenry per meter. This is a good ballpark estimate to use for wires or cables that are some distance from a ground plane or structure. What we just calculated was the self-inductance of a wire above a ground plane. Now let's look at the mutual inductance between a culprit wire and a victim wire at the same height h above a ground plane, and the wires are separated by a distance b. This was precisely the subject of our inductive coupling demonstration. Looking at the cross section with the culprit current pointing in toward the screen, the flux density at a distance r at a point on the plane between the victim wire and the ground plane will have the now familiar magnitude of mu i over 2 pi r. We will define y as the vertical distance from the victim wire to the point of interest on the victim plane, allowing us to define r as the square root of b squared plus y squared, and to rewrite b accordingly. Up until now, we have only considered examples with the b vector normal to the victim plane, which has simplified the calculation. Here, the b vector cuts through the victim plane at an angle off of the normal that we will call theta. Only the normal component of b will contribute to the coupled flux, which is given by b times the cosine of theta. We can see from the intersecting right angles that this angle is also equal to theta, which means that cosine theta equals y over the square root of b squared plus y squared. Thus, the normal component of b is mu i over 2 pi times y over b squared plus y squared. Again, we can consider the flux density to be constant over the length of the wires, and to get the total flux contribution from the culprit wire, we multiply by the length and integrate this expression over y between the limits of a and h. Then we divide out l to get the flux per unit length. We will come back to this presently. Now let's look at the contribution from the image. 
The point of interest lies at a distance from the image wire that we will call R prime, and the flux density contribution B prime equals mu i over 2 pi R prime. We will define Y prime as the vertical distance from the image to the point of interest, allowing us to rewrite R prime and B prime in a similar manner as for the culprit wire, but now in terms of Y prime. Again, only the component of B prime that is normal to the victim loop will contribute to the coupled flux, which is given by B prime times the cosine of theta prime. As before, we can make use of the pair of intersecting right angles to see that this angle is also equal to theta prime, and we can rewrite cosine theta prime in a similar manner, giving us a similar expression as before for the normal component of B prime, but this time in terms of Y prime. To get the total flux contribution from the image, we multiply by the length and integrate this expression over y prime between the limits of h and 2h minus a. Then we divide out L to get the flux per unit length. The total flux is the sum of the contributions from the culprit wire and its image. We evaluate the integrals and plug in the limits, and making use of the properties of logarithms, we combine the terms and get this expression. We divide out the current to get the mutual inductance, and we can divide both top and bottom of the logarithm argument by a squared to put it in terms of the ratios b over a and h over a. Here is a graph of this expression for a relative permeability of 1. It's plotted as a function of b over a for different values of h over a. In our test configuration, the wire radius A was about half a millimeter, and the wire separation B was a few millimeters, giving a B over A ratio of about 6. The height H was about 5 centimeters, giving an H over A ratio of about 100, shown by the purple curve. At a B over A ratio of 6, this curve shows a value of right around 700 nanohenries per meter. Our wire samples were 1 meter long, giving our estimated mutual inductance of 700 nanohenries for that configuration. Now you know where that number came from. A couple more things are worth noting. Of course, separating the wires and increasing the B over A ratio will reduce the mutual inductance and therefore the coupling between culprit and victim, and it's clearly a good idea to put as much space as possible between noisy culprits and sensitive victims. However, just getting the cables closer to the ground plane and reducing the H over A ratio will also significantly reduce the mutual inductance. Remember that with inductive coupling, you are not coupling directly to a conductor per se. Really, you are coupling to the loop formed by the conductor and its reference, in this case, the ground plane. If you reduce that loop area, you reduce the mutual inductance and therefore the coupling. This will be a recurring theme going forward, and it also sounds a bit like fodder for another demonstration in a future session. Now you've learned the basics of electric and magnetic fields. In upcoming sessions, we'll talk about how they come together to form electromagnetic waves, and we'll also discuss what you can do about them. Ciao for now.